Good afternoon. Thank you to the organizers for allowing me to speak and for you coming at still at 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. So I'm actually going to have a quite a bit of overlap with Alice, so I'll be able to move this along fairly quickly. So similar to what Alice said, it's do the right operation for the right reasons. If it's a cancer, are you going to be able to get the exposure and the margins that you need? But even more importantly, does that segment 3 small hepatic adenoma or asymptic, asymptomatic hemangioma really need to come out. It looks like a very nice, easy laparoscopic case, and I think sometimes we can be tempted to do an operation that may be not 100% indicated. So always think about doing the right operation for the right reason in the right patient. As Dr. Wei said, careful selection of your patients is important, and you want to allow for this patient to recover well so that the laparoscopic approach really minimizes the operative stress and enhances the patient recovery. So this meta-analysis was already shown, and um, Dr. Geller and his group really put together the largest consortium of um, laparoscopic cases with 9,527 cases, 65% for malignancy, 35% for benign indications, and an admirable mortality of 0.4%. And they compared it to the open cases, and as, what, as you would expect, there was no increased mortality and fewer compli complications and lower length of stay. So the retrospective data is great, but as Dr. Wei already presented, when you get to a prospective randomized trial, then you really start to see the truth. And when you look at these patients of laparoscopic versus open, they met their primary outcome of postoperative complications, where the laparoscopic group did have a lower rate of complications. They met some of their secondary outcomes in terms of length of stay, and, and Dr. Wei was kind enough to calculate the hour difference for us. Um, but no difference in mortality, OR time, blood loss, R0 resection rates, and no difference in cost at four months, but the LAP group did gain uh, 0 0.01 quality adjusted life years. So it appears that in this short-term outcome, in a prospective randomized trial for patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, there is an improvement with a laparoscopic approach. I think the long-term outcomes are going to be very, very important because I'm sure as many of you saw in the New England Journal of Medicine in December, just a few months ago, for the cervical cancer prospective randomized trial, the patients who had a laparoscopic approach had a decreased disease-free interval and a decreased overall survival. And this was early cervical cancer. So we will need to really follow this cohort of patients and see if the long-term outcomes will pan out um, and be as positive as the short-term outcomes. So I thought I'd just start with a, a few quick definitions because as we go through the talk and talk about learning curves, these will, I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So the hybrid procedure of a laparoscopic mobilization and dissection and a planned limited open incision. Hand assisted, allowing the surgeon to place one hand into the operative field. And I think this hand assisted approach depending on who your co-surgeon is, can be incredibly valuable. I think that if you have a well-trained HPB surgeon or laparoscopic surgeon with you, it's probably less necessary. However, when you're operating with residents and fellows, and if you really do want to give them some independence and allow them to progress, it probably is safer to have the access of the hand port to uh, minimize stress on the patient. And then the laparoscopic approach obviously is a full resection through the trocars and then just an extraction port either in the midline or in a fan and steel. And so Dave Geller asked me to speak about the learning curve. And so when we look at the actual definition of the learning curve, it's a sequential analysis for monitoring change direction. And it was actually established in 1954, and it's an entire statistical method that I didn't put the mathematical equation up. I figured it was already late enough in the afternoon. I didn't want everybody to go to sleep. But it really is composed of a slope which reflects the growing experience that corresponds to continuous improving outcomes. And then during the plateau phase, you have reached the mastery by the operator and you really can't achieve further improvement. And this was really set up for the manufacturing industry and the airline industry, ironically, this day and age, um, was the industry that adopted this. And you can see uh, this is the idealized um, 
learning curve where you have the slope and then you hit the plateau. Now I purposely put Boeing up there because clearly they were at the plateau but have gone back to the slope and need to work on their operations to improve their aircrafts. But our patients aren't a manufacturing assembly line, and they have many different factors. They have different body habits, different comorbidities, which affects our learning curve as we move forward. And so what we want to do is understand and analyze the number of cases to master a new operative t technique. And we want to improve the surgical outcomes, but it doesn't occur at a constant rate. And so when you're looking at these manuscripts that are out there, looking at what the learning curve is, you also need to look at what is the endpoint that they are measuring. Many of them, when looking at efficiency and proficiency, look at the conversion rate. So I would argue very strongly that conversion rate should not be your endpoint. It should not be a measure of failure if you convert, right? You convert for reasons for patient safety. And part of this learning curve, as you go from minor to major resections, you are going to push the envelope. But moving forward in your learning curve should not in any way decrease the outcome of the patient. So if you have to convert, that means you've gotten to a new step of your learning, not that you have failed. Uh, looking at the morbidity and mortality, blood transfusion, length of stay, oncologic outcomes, these are all different measures that are out there in the manuscripts. And so when you look at these different learning curves, they aren't that beautiful idealized slope where in a stepwise fashion you're always improving. But rather they look more like this seesaw pattern where you start off, you're slow, it's harder, you have complications, you start to improve, you get to a point of comfort, you start to push the limit a little bit more, your complications go up or your blood loss goes up and your time goes up. And then it basically goes up and down as you progress towards a level of expertise. And what that case number for the level of expertise is, is hard to define. And so when we look at these and we look at your, your learning curve, it really is a continuum, right? From easier resections to moderately difficult resections to very difficult resections. And this, as Dr. Wei has already pointed out, is beautifully illustrated by these criteria and get a point system, right? So we look at location, tumor size, uh, proximity to major vasculature, how much liver are you taking? Are you using a hybrid um, or hand-assisted technique? And then obviously unique to liver is, is the patient cirrhotic or not? And this was actually validated in a paper that just came out a few days ago, it was April 2019 surgery issue, where they combined about 1,800 patients from multiple centers in Japan and about 480 patients from Brice Gaillet and from Paris and Montsouris. And they were able to demonstrate that when you apply these criteria, it does correspond with a decreased complication rate and a decreased mortality. So this is very helpful as you're moving forward. And you know, Dr. Wei already went over these consensus conference guidelines, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But I did think that the Southampton consensus conference in 2017 to follow up the conference in 2014 was helpful. And it was very nice because um, they split it out also in terms of why you're operating. So for colorectal liver metastases, uh, laparoscopic approach has improved short-term outcomes and similar long-term outcomes in retrospective series. So the long-term outcomes are still yet to be determined um, from the prospective randomized trial. For HCC, we see lower blood loss, less postoperative ascites, less liver failure, decreased length of stay, with comparable OR times, disease-free margin, and recurrence rates. And then for benign lesions, uh, obviously the cosmetic results are probably even more important for benign lesions than malignant lesions, so it becomes even more attractive. They talked about some of the technical aspects, which I think are important, but most importantly, they put together all the data in the literature to really look at what they thought and this is a very large group of experts from all over the world, including Go and David, um, looking at the data. And they found that 60 minor resections really is where you're going to start to plateau. And that goes into 55 major resections 
to be able to reach your plateau. And as Dr. Wei already mentioned, having a co-surgeon who's an experienced surgeon will speed up your learning curve. Um, so that is definitely something to keep in mind as you're starting out in practice and moving on these laparoscopic livers. So I think from all of these consensus conferences and the data out there, as you progress, going from a normal to a cirrhotic liver, a benign to a malign malignant lesion, a peripheral lesion, a left lateral segmentectomy, segments 4B, 5, and or 6, then to a major hepatectomy, and then what I think, and I think many would agree, are some of the hardest operations technically, is segments 1, 4A, 7, and 8 in isolation. So in conclusion, the surgeons have to be able to perform open hepatectomies and laparoscopic operations as well as having ultrasound skills. You really do need careful patient selection. There are, you will need about 60 minor resections to start to reach your plateau from your learning curve, followed by 55 major resections to really be feeling comfortable and know that you are gonna minimize the complications. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your attention. <laughs>